All right. Well, um, you know, in the last few years, especially, uh, pap testing in in uh, bulls has really become a uh, kind of a front uh, front burner topic at a lot of our industry uh, meetings, and you know. A lot of coffee shop talk and um, some of the talk is good, uh, but there's a lot of, I think, misinformation out there that uh, makes it a little uh, challenging sometimes, especially when we're trying to help all the various aspects of the industry. And so I just thought I'd talk a little bit about brisket disease today, uh, kind of some of the trends we're seeing, uh, talk about pap testing, pulmonary artery pressure testing in, in uh, beef animals, and, uh, and then kind of maybe try looking at what maybe a little of the future holds. So, um, just a little overview, uh, we'll talk about uh, what brisket disease is, give a little history, some of the symptoms, and along with those symptoms, some of the challenges, and then, you know, hopefully uh, talk maybe a little at the end about some solutions or where we need to be going. Okay, uh, brisket disease has a lot of different monikers. Uh, the one that's most common is high altitude disease, but it's also known as uh, bovine high mountain disease. And probably the most descriptive is right heart failure. Um, as far as the history goes, it was first reported back in 1953 over not too far from where I grew up in Colorado, a place called South Park. Uh, what was going on is uh, those, those guys that were running at high altitudes were going down to the plains, buying bulls, bringing them up, uh, having them breed their cows. And as they uh, were getting the calves, they started losing a lot of calves. And so they contacted uh, Dr. Glover and, and Newsom over at the Colora Colorado Agricultural College at that time. And uh, they came over, did some studies, uh, looked at necropsying a lot of the calves. And that's, uh, that's the first reported incident that we have. Uh, and up until the 1960s, we really didn't see it exhibited much other than in cattle that were at greater than 7,000 feet uh, elevation. And so that's how it came to be known as high altitude disease. Um, some of the cl clinical symptoms that we see, uh, the calves act depressed, They'll separate from the herd. Uh, quite often will experience labored breathing. The, the swelling, uh, edema in the brisket that can extend up into the uh, jawline, also back into the peritoneal cavity. Um, hence, we get the name brisket disease. Um, it can also, in, in severe cases, uh, will actually show a distension of the jugular vein uh, when, when pressures get really high. Um, the animals will be difficult or reluctant to move, and if you push them, they may just collapse and die. <clears throat> so, given, given those clinical descriptions, which uh, 
which of these animals do you think might be uh, have brisket disease or, or high altitude disease? This one and this one down here kind yeah, of so looked. If you want to answer, Kim, you have to unmute your uh, computer. Okay. And I'm not sure how to do that. No, no, they just need to. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, these both look pretty depressed, kind of, kind of frumpy. Some swelling in all of all of them in the brisket area. But you know, if in in truth, only this calf in the middle is actually experiencing. Uh, brisket disease or, or right heart failure. This calf and this calf here uh, both have bovine respiratory disease. Uh, this bull up here ate a poisonous plant that caused swelling in the, the brisket and up into the, the uh, jawline. As did this cow, uh, you can see the extended or distended uh, jugular there. Uh, was also a result of, of something other than uh, right heart failure. And, and that really is one of the things that, that is a real problem with accurate diagnoses, because so many of the different things that uh, calves can, can get and cattle can experience uh, will exhibit the same signs as as what we see in, in uh, high altitude disease or brisket disease. <clears throat> so um, it, it becomes quite a challenge for us to, to accurately diagnose uh, when we have those animals that are sick. So the, the primary cause of uh, it is pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in in humans. Um, some of the the specific contributing factors: high altitude exposure, obviously, uh, bovine respiratory disease. If the if the calf gets pneumonia, it can precipitate it. Um, slow or shallow breathing. Uh, Dr. Neary and and his associates at uh, Texas Tech and, and over at CSU reported just this year that uh, that was one of the things that uh, contributed a and uh, was seen more at, at high altitude, but now is being seen even at lower altitudes. Um, and, and from the, the understanding, and Carrie, you can jump in anywhere here if you want. Uh, when when the blood is uh, when when there are low levels of oxygen in the lungs, it causes the the uh, pulmonary artery to constrict uh, and and narrow, and that decreased blood flow. It, it's kind of like a, an irrigation line that's partially plugged or or crimped off it increases the pressure. Um, and, and so, you know, that's the, when, when we're talking about this slow or shallow labored breathing that we see in, in cases of pneumonia, uh, that's why it can precipitate uh, high, high blood pressure or the, the pulmonary hypertension. Um, there are also other uh, environmental stresses, uh, you know, heat stress and, and cold stress can also elevate uh, pulmonary artery pressure. And so, you know, there, there are a lot of different, uh, it's, it's a kind of a multifaceted disease. So when we're talking about brisket, what's the incidence? Well, uh, HECT, and his associates in 1962 estimated that it was approximately 7,000, uh, 
1% in cattle that ran at 7,000 or greater elevation. They didn't really see a lot uh, at lower elevations. And so it was primarily considered just to be associated with, with high altitude. However, uh, Dr. Neri in uh, 2013 studied five ranches in southwest Colorado. Um, these, these ranches were in the, the Sanger de Criso Mountains. Uh, and on one of those ranches, they lost 9.6% of their calves from branding to weaning. Of the, that 9.6%, they were only able to find half of the calves to do necropsies on. And half of those, so a, a quarter of their death losses, were confirmed to be due to brisket disease. Now, the rub here is this ranch, all, all five of these ranches, had been selecting low pap bulls for the last 20 years and and using those bulls to to breed their cattle and and so you know that if if you extrapolate out that uh 25 percent to cover all the calves that they lost you're up to almost five percent death loss directly attributable to uh, to brisket disease. Now, one of the things that uh, that we're starting to see uh, is we're starting to see the disease rear its ugly head at, at low elevations. And uh, back in 1974, there were four feedlots that were studied, and those four feedlots showed a, a rate of about three out of 10,000 fed cattle that died from brisket disease. Um, and the, the tough thing about feedlot cattle is most of the time, it doesn't really impact them until they're within about a month of slaughter. So they've got all this feed and expense into them, and uh, and then they lose the calf. So it's it's a very expensive situation when you get to the feedlot. Uh, in 2012, uh, Dr. Neri studied 15 different feedlots, and these feedlots were the I believe he said the the elevation was. Uh, below 3,000 feet elevation. And that incidence had risen to about 15 out of every 10,000 uh, cattle fed. Uh, so it is a, it's a significant problem, it's growing. And, and the thing that's a little scary is we're seeing this situation move into uh, lower elevations. And that's what's causing a, a, some real heartburn in the industry. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about uh, Utah bulls. For the last 11 years at the bull test station, we've been PAP testing and, and collecting this uh, pulmonary artery pressure data on, on the bulls on test. When we first started, it was uh, at the request of, of some of our uh, buyers that, that run at elevation. And uh, they, so we, we started it as basically a, a, a voluntary program. If you wanted your bulls, PAP tested, we do it. Um, as the years have gone by and PAP testing has become more mainstream, um, now it's required on all the bulls. They're tested at about 
a little over 5,100 feet elevation, which is not ideal. Um, it, it really isn't ideal. That's kind of the, the bottom end of, of where uh, the animal scientists have recommended testing. Ideally, it would be better to test them at 7,000 feet. And one of the things that we recommend for those that buy bulls out of the test station are that they take them to elevation, acclimate them for three weeks, and have them retested. And with the guarantee that, that the sellers will stand behind them. Um, anyway, we, we have data across eight breeds and composites, including Black, Red Angus, Simmental, Gelby, Hereford, Charlay, Sim Angus, and Balancer. And this is kind of the, what we're seeing as far as uh, the data. This is average PAP score across all breeds. And the slope on this shows that even though we're working on selecting bulls that are, are low, uh, you know, selecting to breed for bulls that are low PAP, we're increasing the, the average PAP score across all breeds um, at, a, at a rate of almost one uh, point per year. And there's a lot of variation you can see between, between the years. Uh, you know, we get down into some valleys here. But overall, if you go back to 2008 and then look at 2018, we've got a, we've, we've increased significantly. The three breeds that we have the most data on are Angus, Hereford, and, and Red Angus, as far as total numbers. And you can see um, that we have a significant difference between Herefords and Red Angus. However, there is no significant difference between Angus and Hereford or Angus and Red Angus. Uh, statistically, but the and and you can see the that they mirror the averages for each breed kind of mirror each other, uh, but in the end, the the red we've seen the greatest increase in red Angus of the of these three breeds. <clears throat> So what are the challenges with right heart failure? Well, I guess first and foremost is testing is pretty invasive. Um, basically what we do when we test for pulmonary artery pressure is we take a three, ga uh, three inch 12 gauge needle, insert it into the jugular, then thread a catheter down through the needle, into the heart, through the heart, and back up into the pulmonary artery. And once the catheter enters the pulmonary artery, then we can take the, the pressure reading. Um, it's, it's not dissimilar really to uh, the procedure uh, uh, that followed in a human angiogram where they put in a stent or something. The difference is we go through the jugular rather than uh, up through the leg like on humans. Um, this is, this is uh, an image of a, a normal pulmonary artery wave. And what, what you see is you see this peak followed by kind of a plateau before it drops off, another peak, another plateau, peak, plateau. And that's, uh, that's how the, the vet actually uh, determines that he's, enter he's gone from the 
the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery is uh, this change in on his uh, oscilloscope and uh, and the reading that he gets. Um, this was provided by Dr. Holt and Callan. Dr. Holt is kind of the the guru of PAP testing uh, and is a faculty member at CSU and and actually has a practice over on the West Slope, uh, south of Grand Junction. <clears throat> well, the other thing is it appears to be multifaceted as far as the cause. And we know that there's a genetic component involved uh, that we've, we've determined over years and years of data. But most recently, we've started to see that there is a disease component that is contributing to these elevated uh, incidents of, of right heart failure, as well as some environmental components. Uh, some of the, I think, fascinating research that's coming out is, uh, you know, over the last several years, um, we've been really concentrating on improving uh, carcass quality. Well, in, in us humans, when, when we get uh, more fat in our body structure, we start having some heart problems. And it, they're starting to look at what we've done through genetic selection to increase the uh, intramuscular fat in uh, cattle and look and see if that is having some impacts on our, the, the problem that we're seeing with right heart failure. So, what do we have for solutions? And this is, this is kind of a challenge to us. One of the things that we need to start recommending to our producers, if they're really concerned about uh, getting right heart failure out of their calf crops, we need to be testing not only the herd sires that are coming in, that we're buying, and making sure that they have uh, uh, correct uh, low PAP scores. But we also need to be testing our replacement heifers and culling any cows that we've, we know that have had right heart failure calves. Because it's, it's got to be both sides of the, the breeding equation. Uh, that we look at and and we can see that just by breeding you know just selecting the sire side and not paying attention to the cow side we're not helping ourselves to to eliminate the problem or reduce the problem to, to a more manageable uh, place. Now, the Angus Association has developed an EPD for pulmonary artery pressure. Um, there's a lot of talk in the industry that this, that this is going to be a panacea. I'm not as confident as maybe a lot of people are. I, I think it'll be just what most of our EPDs are, and that is good selection tool. However, it's not going to be uh, the the silver bullet. I don't think. Um, I think finally we need to to really look at the the causal components to. What is, what is causing all this right heart failure? 
especially since we're now seeing it at much lower elevations. Um, and I don't know, maybe that comes through better diagnostics. Um, if we could get a, it, it would be wonderful if we could identify uh, some genetic markers that uh, would, would help us with this. The problem is when, since it does appear to be multifaceted as far as the cause side goes, um, it's going to be tough getting getting a genetic test, and and uh, so we'll we'll just have to work through it. Um, that's really pretty much all that I had for today. Uh, I I hope I've been able to answer more questions than I've caused. Uh, but if you have questions. Uh, Fire away. Oh, excellent. Good job, uh, Kim. I had a couple of questions on that data. That's kind of interesting. So um, we know that it's sort of multifactorial, the cause. And there was some, you know, people have proposed a genetic thing. In fact, the, in essence, the Angus people have developed sort of a try to predict a uh, predictive number to that. But of the people who have repeated high pat bulls, are they out of the same family lines? Do you know? And they, number yeah. two, are the same ranches sort of the repeat offenders? Do you understand what I'm asking? I mean, is it the same ranches using um, breeding? You know, you know uh, yes, yes and no. <laughs> uh, for, first of all, there is a lot of uh, anecdotal uh, data out there that indicates that it is uh, directly attributable to some family lines. Now, um, I, I say that with this caveat. This year, uh, we we saw we have a uh, one one ranch in particular that's brought bulls to the test for several years. Um, they have been selecting, basically doing what I had on that last slide. Uh, they've been testing all their bulls. They've been uh, looking at making sure that the the bloodlines that they're bringing in through AI are have a good proven track record they've been testing all their replacement heifers for a number of years and this year they had bulls that that were high when we tested in fact uh one one of the bulls uh that was not did not make the sale uh, that they were just looking to sell private treaty uh, when when it was tested was in right heart failure. The day it was tested had a uh, PAP test over a hundred, and uh, so you know the this is a ranch that has historically been been really good on their PAP scores. And now all of a sudden, we get a year where it's just crazy. They had, I think, two bulls out of their nine bulls they had on test, mm. tested over, over 60. That would be really interesting to look at uh, with that data set to sort of see if there's any uh, ranch or herd familial trends. That would be mm. really interesting. And, and I can say that uh, some of the, uh, some of the bulls uh, that we've seen exhibit symptoms over the past few years have come from the same ranches. So that that indicates that there is a probably a ranch effect. Uh, but then you get this other one that's a total anomaly. So 
I, I don't know. There, there's a lot of work that could be done for sure.